Ben Dominich. I'm the publisher of The Federalist. I'm happy to be joined today for a conversation uh, with Missouri Senator Josh Hawley. Uh, sir, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us today. Thanks for having me. I have a lot of different things to talk to you about today, but I think that we have to spend some time on the developments that we've seen in recent weeks as it relates to China. Uh, the Secretary of State is giving remarks this week that talk about that relationship in some pretty stark terms. You and I had some time together in Hong Kong last year where we saw kind of the early nature of the crackdown there. Uh, tell me a little bit about your perspective on uh, America's changing relationship with China and how you view it as a political issue. Well, I mean, it, it is the foreign policy, the national security challenge of the 21st century. There's no doubt about that. And maybe really the economic challenge of the 21st century as well. I mean, China, the China shock, as some economists call it, that uh, started when we normalized trade relations and uh, allowed China to jo join the WTO, gosh, 20 years ago now. I mean, that has had a tremendous effect, almost all negative, uh, on our labor force domestically and therefore on our domestic politics. And there's no doubt that China is an imperial power. We may as well just, you know, call the spade a spade. They're an imperial power. They want to be the dominant world power. We stand between them and those ambitions. And it is vital we continue to do so. Uh, so this is going to be a, a long struggle uh, with this regime. I hope that what the last few months with this COVID crisis has done, if anything, if, uh, if it's accomplished anything at all for the positive, it has disabused the chattering class of this idea that China can be accommodated uh, and that uh, further integrating them into the global economic system, into uh, the foreign policy system, will somehow liberalize them. They're not gonna liberalize. That's not their ambition. Their ambition is to, is to dominate. And that's something that we simply cannot afford to have happen for our own security, economic and otherwise. I recall the debates of the Clinton years that had a bipartisan push for most favored nation status, for you know an opening up in terms of our relationship with China. Looking back on those years, do you think that we were making mistakes in that time maybe out of the hubris of having won the Cold War, out of uh, you know other ambitions that we had in terms of opening up Chinese markets to American businesses. What do you think was wrong about the assumptions made at the time about the way that trade with China would play out? You know, I think we're gonna look back on the 1990s, which at the time, you know, I was a kid in the 90s, the, a teenager in the 90s, went to high school in the 90s. And I remember at the time, all, all the commentary was about how the 90s was like the holiday from history. You know, I mean, it seemed like that the Cold War was over. We were triumphant. Our economy seemed to be in good shape. I mean, we, you know, America bestrode the world as a colossus. I think we'll actually look back on the 90s and realize it was a hugely significant time. And we made a whole bunch of bad decisions and particularly our establishment, foreign policy establishment, economic establishment, political class made a whole bunch of bad decisions. And one of the things that really became prevalent in the 90s is this sort of global uh, hubris, this globalist hubris, this idea that it, what it really is when you come down to it, it's, a, it's an idea of empire. And it's the idea that America would make the whole world like America, uh, that the boundaries between us and the rest of the world and between other nations and the world would cease to exist. We'd have one global unified market and one global unified liberal international system. It's the Wilsonian ambition, if you wanna put it in a historical context, uh, that some in the United States have been pushing for since the days of, of Wilson and finally thought they had realized in the 90s. Turns out that that, that was a mistake. Uh, it, it's a mistake in principle, I think, but it certainly has proven to be a mistake in practice. And, uh, you know, you can make an argument that as it relates to specific policies about trying to integrate China, that, that maybe that was worth giving a try. Uh, they certainly have not succeeded. I, I, I think that what we see more broadly is that the ambition to create a single unified liberal international order was indeed hubristic and uh, we are we are reaping the consequences of that now and uh, that's part of what we're going to have to face in the years going forward there's a tendency to look at things from the perspective of the marketplace as being you know what's the downside what's the downside for importing you know a lot of inexpensive goods that make human life and, and the, uh, the things that we enjoy in a consumer economy here in America, all that much better to make a, a life more affordable for people because they can uh, you know, have their dollar go a lot further when it purchases these various products that are made in China. But what do you think is the downside of that when it comes to importing perhaps 
a lot of the same values that that Chinese regime has in place and potentially security threats of the various things that we import now in the form of technology. Well, we've seen that China is not bashful about trying to use its market power in order to influence the way that American corporations do business and the way that Americans speak in our own country. Take the NBA, for example. Uh, last October, in, in the, during the Hong Kong, one of the early stages of the Hong Kong crisis, and then you and I, as you said, we went to Hong Kong right around that time period together and we're on the ground with the protesters. But right at that time, Daryl Morey of the Houston Rockets had the temerity to retweet. He didn't even write the tweet. He just retweeted one little tweet that said, free Hong Kong. And what did Beijing do? Beijing brought their enormous market power to bear on the NBA. They wanted him fired. They wanted, uh, they, they wanted the NBA to, to kneel and pay obeisance uh, to uh, the Chinese Communist Party, which the NBA basically did. And what was the threat of all of that? You won't get access to our market. I, I think that this is a symptom uh, an illustration, a sign of what Beijing is going to do in the years to come. They, they are not going to, they don't play the free enterprise rule by the rules that we play by. And they don't have any intention of, of doing so. They're going to, they're the ultimate monopolist in a way, right? I mean, that's their goal is to use their market power to leverage it in order to impose their values, their style of capitalism on us. And this is, by the way, one of the things we found with that dream from the 90s, of a single unified liberal international market. It turns out that what that really did was allow China uh, to, uh, to rise and, and to, to systematically rig the system in a way that has benefited them and really hurt us. One other point then just on this, if you wanna talk about some of the downside, have we gotten more cheap stuff from China? Yeah, sure we have in the last 20 years, but we paid a price for that. In a lot of ways, we, we paid a price of speech, we paid a price uh, with our own values, but we've also paid a price in jobs. And we paid a price a particular kind of job. And I think this is important because a lot of times you hear economists say, well, but the, the aggregate benefits outweigh the aggregate losses. But lives can't be measured in the aggregate like that. And there's been a particular class of Americans who have borne the brunt of the China shock and have borne the brunt of those dreams of a liberal, unified, global, internationalist economy. And that's the working class. They've seen their jobs go overseas. They've seen their wages flatline. And that happened before the China shock, or that was underway before the China shock occurred. But the China shock has been a big part of that. That's something that we need to own up to. And that's a huge problem that we need to confront going forward. Before I get off China, there is a, uh, a situation there that I think is of a great deal of importance to those who care about religious freedom around the world and human rights. And that's obviously the situation regarding the Uyghur Muslims and the work camps that we've become aware of. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak to some of the people who have relatives uh, in those camps. The stories that they tell are, are very harrowing. And now we learn that there are some American businesses that uh, have relied on uh, the labor of people who, uh, you know, were in those camps to the degree to which, you know, I think is still an open question in, in several regards. Uh, I'll put to you the same question I put to the Secretary of State a couple of weeks ago, which is, do you believe there should be consequences for American companies that uh, rely on that type of forced labor or are found to have relied on it? No, oh, indeed. Yes, I do. And I've introduced legislation uh, to make sure that there are consequences. I, I think it's really simple, actually. I think we should ask, we should demand that American multinationals of a certain size, I mean, they're the big, vast multinational corporations who are doing business in China and who are using in their supply chain forced labor, but slave labor, that's what it is. Whether it's in the Uyghur camps or elsewhere, I think we should force them to disclose it, A, and B, to end it. And if they will not do so, then they should be sanctioned for doing so. They should be subject to penalties and fines here in the United States. And I've gone a step further and I have challenged the head of these multinational, the heads plural of these multinational corporations to take a pledge right now that they and their corporation are slave free. I think Nike should take that pledge. I think the NBA should take that pledge. I think all of the big American multinationals, all of these sectors should take that pledge that they are slave free and if they're not, then they need to get to be slave free. If you wanna talk about social responsibility, let's talk about not profiting on the modern day slave trade. The way that the American Rights Coalition has evolved in recent years is interesting. It's a, uh, it's a situation that I think results in uh, a base, a voter base that is both uh, more populist and more working class, 
uh, one that you know shifts uh, more into the Rust Belt and the Midwest. Uh, and your perspective on this, I think, uh, is particularly valuable as a, a senator from the Midwest who's going to be confronting an economy in which a lot of those working members of your community in the working and middle class are going to be hardest hit by the experience of this global pandemic. Uh, people who are frankly going to have a much more difficult time, even now they are having a more difficult time than those members of the knowledge economy or the, the knowledge worker, however you wanna uh, describe it. Tell me a little bit about what conservatism has to offer those members of the community, particularly your brand. Well, I think it is. I think if conservatism is going to have a future in the 21st century, uh, and if the Republican Party is going to have an electoral future in the 21st century, it has got to become it. The party has got to become the party of working people, and there's nothing more conservative than that. I mean, our, here's how I think about this, Ben. Just to go, to go to first principles, our country is founded on a very unique proposition, and that is that the normal person. The, uh, the common man, as the saying used to be, Theodore Roosevelt, who's a boyhood hero of mine, used to say the plain people, he loved that expression, that, that the plain people, good, honest, hardworking, working class folks, that they could be citizens, that they could hold the preponderance of power in our republic, and that the kind of life that they lead, the life of work and faith and home and family, that that ought to be the life that the whole republic is organized around. That's new in the history of the world, no other republic ever organized on that basis at all, not even close. That is one of the things, maybe the thing that makes us so unique as Americans and as conservatives, we need to be for that, which means we need to be fighting for that working class. We need to be fighting for that way of life. We need to be fighting for their interests, their virtues, their voice. And by the way, that, that, is, not, uh, that is not a working class of one particular ethnic background. Uh, one particular geographic background. You find working class folks everywhere in all cities and all regions of all races. Uh, but but that is it is built into the American experience. It, by the way, you know the episodes of populism that is a recurring theme in American history, almost always driven by working class folks who want their voice in government to be heard. So I think that is what conservatives have to fight for because it, it is so fundamental to our character as a nation. And that means that we're gonna to have to get to be more interested than conservatives have been in past decades. We're gonna have to be more interested in uh, the job security of working class folks, uh, in the labor market and what that looks like for them, and not just in the interests of the C-suite. Because uh, the C-suite, the you know, they've, they've done great uh, for the last 30, 40 years, working people not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, just as we wrap up, one of the things that seems to me to be a point of comparison is that, you know, during the period of the of the 1980s in particular, but prior to that, of course, you had this period of fusionism on the right, where the the forces of you know national defense conservatives, social conservatives, and fiscal conservatives were bound together uh, by an opposition to the, the Soviet Union and, and learned to kind of share their different priorities in that time. Do you think that that type of, of fusionist approach is possible in the future? What would it require in order to have it take on uh, a real representation of what, uh, not just the Republican coalition, but those who are on uh, the right and the center right uh, can come together and, and be united around? Well, I, I certainly think it, it's, it's, it's not only possible, it's necessary because politics is always about building coalitions of folks who, who agree on some things, they don't agree on other things. And the question becomes, what is the animating principle? What's, what's the thing that sort of draws us all together and, and unifies the constellation of, of, of different viewpoints, if you like. And in this era that, that we are, that is dawning upon us now, I, I do think that that organizing principle has got to be the fate of working Americans and their control over their democracy, their culture, the preservation of that working class way of life that has defined our country and the kind of democracy that it has given us. That I think is, is our great challenge as a country and also as conservatives. And I think there's a lot of room uh, to, uh, to welcome into that coalition folks who take different approaches to that issue. Uh, who have uh, different perspectives on it. But even the China issue really integrates into this one. I mean, the China shock, as I say, has been hardest economically 
on those who belong to the working class, to the middle class. They're the ones who truly borne the brunt. Uh, and, and they're the ones whose li livelihoods are on the line going forward with China. So the China challenge is something that will also unite us, but I, I think it is part of this broader need uh, to preserve and fight for that working class character of our democracy and of, of our republic and our politics. And I think that that's work, family, neighborhood. Uh, these are gonna be the great uh, challenges of our time. Uh, one last question before I let you go, which is just this. Uh, there's a real degree of frustration on the part of a lot of conservative parents who I've heard from in recent weeks regarding the reopening of schools this fall uh, and their frustrations that they feel like that's not going to be something that happens for them, uh, for those public school students in particular uh, who are in the, the early elementary and middle school era. Is this something that presents an opportunity for conservatives to potentially advance uh, a de greater degree of educational freedom? If we're not gonna have public schools reopen in, in the fall, is there anything that can be done legislatively to offer uh, those parents new opportunities for schooling um, in on either a micro level or or helping them uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, their fiscal opportunities to teach their children and make sure that they don't fall behind even if they live in states uh, that feel that the public schools are not going to be able to fully reopen yeah, I, I certainly think that we need to be, first of all, giving schools, uh, public school districts, established schools, the resources that they need and also a push to reopen as quickly as, as they can. I mean, the, the data on this is, is really significant. Having kids in social isolation for this period of time is not good for kids. I mean, it's period. And yes, that's got to be balanced. There are, there are other considerations here. I understand that. And some of that will vary regionally. But, but let's get clear on what the bottom line is. Kids need to be with other kids in safe settings. And they need to be learning. And look, I, I said I've got two small boys at home. You can count this conservative parent and my wife as among the folks who really want our kids to go back to school. But partly because, <laughs> you know, it, it, we, we see the effects. And our boys are small. You know, we have nothing to complain about. But you know, it, it's important for kids to be able to, to, to be socialized, to, to be in that environment, to be able to play sports, I think also when they're of a certain age. So I think the answer to your question, Ben, is yes. I think it is, it is vital uh, that we explore every option that we can, including giving support to parents who may say that, well, now I may have to homeschool. Uh, I may have to do a co-op. I may have to mm -hmm. partner with some other parents and, and maybe we're gonna figure this out ourselves, but my kids need the structure they need to be socialized. We're going to have to. We're going to have to figure this out. Uh, and by the way, just back to the future of conservatism, I, I think that if if we are not the party of families and working families uh, and and working parents, then we've done something wrong. I mean, we're seriously off base. And the family, you know, it's incredibly difficult to raise a child. Uh, in this era, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, it, it's incredible. There are there are pressures on all sides. Uh, that there's pressures on the children. Uh, families need help. They need protection. They need safeguards. They need help. And that's something that I think, as a conservative, has got to be at the center of what we're about. Mm -hmm. Senator Josh Hawley, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.